Good morning and a warm welcome to all participants. I'm Marco Montanari from the Directorate General for Education, Youth, Sport and Culture of the European Commission. I have the pleasure of moderating today's webinar on COVID-19 learning deficits in Europe, which is hosted by the European Expert Network on Economics of Education, INI. For those who are not familiar with it, INI advises and supports the European Commission in the analysis of economic aspects of education policies and reforms. Uh, before going straight to the content part of this webinar, let me just share three pieces of, inf of practical information with you. Uh, first, the webinar will be recorded and the recording will be available on the INI website in a few days and you will receive uh, an email notification when the recording will be ready. Uh, the report uh, that uh, Professor De Witte will present today has now been published on the INI website again, and we are going to provide you with the link in the chat uh, in a minute. And finally, of course, you're welcome to type your questions and comments at any time in the chat during the presentations and our speakers will address them during the last part of the webinar. Now I leave the floor to our first speaker, Akis Kiriakou, Deputy Head of Unit for Evidence-Based Policy and Evaluation in the Directorate General for Education, Youth, Sport and Culture of the European Commission. Uh, Akis will introduce us to the European Commission policy context related to the impact of COVID-19 on education. So Akis, please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marco. I'd like to welcome all uh, participants on uh, my behalf. I would also like to uh, thank the organizers and the uh, author of their report for being here with us today, as well as uh, the colleagues uh, that uh, are contributing as discussants and moderators. Uh, from uh, our side, I'd like just to uh, say a few words about the policy context and why uh, we have uh, embarked on doing the research in this uh, area. As uh, everyone knows, the COVID-19 pandemic has triggered a, a huge disruption to uh, the education systems around the Europe and everywhere in the world. From the beginning of the pandemic, the European Commission has worked very closely with member states uh, to respond to it, and uh, significant support for investment education skills uh, was made available through the Recovery and Resilience Facility. Uh, this amounts to more than 70 billion euros. On top of that, there's also uh, funding available through the cohesion policy, and this will also contribute to investments in education in the next years. Such uh, investments, but also reforms in the area of uh, uh, education uh, will cover a very broad uh, spectrum uh, aiming to strengthen the resilience of education systems, but also addressing uh, the extent, uh, the results of the pandemic. The newly created uh, learning lab on investing in quality education and training uh, set up by uh, the European Commission will work with uh, EU member states to promote the use of rigorous evaluation tools and practices uh, to promote uh, uh, better education policy making. Here, I invite you to visit the Learning Lab page on the portal of the European Education Area to know more about this initiative and how it can help your country. Uh, you can find the link in the, in the chat just posted. Uh, in this context, uh, trying to see what are the issues, uh, what are the problems, and uh, what uh, works well, what doesn't work so well. Uh, we are trying to understand how the pandemic affected uh, learning outcomes across age, subject, gender, and socioeconomic background. Uh, this is a necessary precondition to identify which policy measures can efficiently help uh, to address any learning losses. This is uh, the reason why we would very much welcome the report presented here today. It provides a comprehensive analysis and a clear synthesis of the research developed in this field in many European countries uh, between uh, 2020 and 2022. I'm sure you will enjoy the presentation uh, and the discussion that will follow. Without 
preempting it, let me just tell you about uh, some, uh, well, the key message I draw from this report. Uh, for me, it is clear uh, that we must uh, live to our ambitions as envisaged in the European education area, and we should focus on uh, implementing its actions. The resources uh, invested in education uh, should open up new opportunities and maximize learning outcomes, uh, foster inclusion, and support the well being of all our youth. Without uh, further ado, I give uh, the floor to, to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aki. So, this introduction has led us to the core of our webinar because our next speaker is Christophe De Witt, full professor of education economics and political economy at the Faculty of Economics and Business at the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. So Christophe will present us uh, the main findings from his new INI report, COVID-19 Learning Deficits in Europe, Analysis and Practical Recommendations. So please, Christophe. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, introduction and for um, all of you being here. So my name is Diet is uh, Christophe de Witte. I'm a professor at the University of Leuven, and together with Maxime Francois, I have wrote this uh, report on uh, the learning deficits in Europe. And of course, it's already a long time ago. It seems a long time ago. So I would like to remind you a little bit on how it looked like back in the time. So in March 2020, we all suddenly had to go over to empty classes. Empty classes in any school building, any primary education building, any secondary education building, and any university building, and everybody had to switch to uh, distance learning. Distance learning, which was kind of pre-teaching in many of in many countries in the beginning, and which ended up in real distance learning after a while. And you might remember uh, the distance learning because uh, for those who had kids, this was a very difficult time, a difficult time for both the kids as well as the parents because you had to do a lot of multitasking, the kids had to do a lot of multitasking, etc. And um, once we could go back to school, you remember the time that there were a lot of restrictions, so there were the face masks, uh, there were the quarantines, uh, there were additional holidays, etc. So it seems a very long time ago, but the question is so, what happened at that time and what, what was the impact of those COVID restrictions, what was the impact on the learning outcomes? And this report, we first start with looking at the length of the school closures. So within Europe, we see significant variation in the, the time that there was an, um, a school closure. Um, so I see this is an, um, in some countries, there was um, no school closure at all. In other countries, there was a lengthy school closure. And so on average, we observe about nine weeks of school closures, which corresponds to about a third of a school year. So nine um, weeks is quite a lengthy period, quite a lengthy period with disruptions. And of course, this was the initial period in, 19, uh, in the first school year. Afterwards, there were the restrictions with face masks, uh, with extra holidays, with quarantines, etc. The impact of that, if we summarize this uh, for Europe, we see that it has a significant impact on learning outcomes. There's quite a bit of variation across countries and some Nordic countries and some Nordic regions, we don't find any learning deficits at all. Uh, but the learning deficits is what a student should have learned in the same time um, and what he or she didn't learn. And other countries like in Italy, we observe in, uh, learning deficits of 0.19 standard deviations um, in Flanders 0.18 in England 0.15 uh, standard deviations, etc. In some countries, the learning deficit is even more outspoken with, for instance, in Poland 0.3 standard deviations and Greece 0.22 uh, standard deviations. On average, if you look at all European countries and regions, we observe an, an average learning deficits of about uh, 0.11 standard deviations. And of course, it seems like a very minor number, but it's not. It means that a student who was at the pandemic, the median student, so at the fifth percentile out of 100 students, is suddenly bounced back to the 40, 46th percentile. Or if you express this in kind of learning deficits in months, this means that this corresponds to about three months of learning deficits and three months of, of progress that wasn't made at the time. So you see that across Europe, quite a bit of variation. So if you look at the 0.11 standard deviation on average, you can see for the different countries where there was more learning um, deficits in terms of learning months than in other countries. The question is, of course, yeah, 
does it matter? Does this matter or not? And so first, if you look at um, the potential implications, it really matters. And that's why um, the various actions, the policy actions are so important. Because we know from the literature that if you have lower test outcomes, that is associated with lower human capital formation. So we know less, we have less skills, less uh, competence, etc. And this creates quite a bit of long-term challenges. Long-term challenges which are, have been associated with annual lifetime learnings, for instance. We earn less because we didn't produce, we're not as smart, as good, as uh, have skillful as, as before. We have future lower future earnings, uh, lower employment, and of course, if you add up all of those individual characteristics, we have less general prosperity. Again, if you translate to 1.1 standard deviation on average for Europe, we see that um, this corresponds to a decreased future income of about 1.3%, as was uh, computed by Chetty at the time. Or we observe that it's uh, correspond to a decrease of 0.3 um, of 0.4 percentage in the probability of finding a job. You see that this has a real impact um, on pupils' life and on uh, average prosperity. But of course, it all matters or it all questions. So this is the immediate impact of the pandemic, the immediate impact immediately after the um, the pandemic. So the question, yeah, is yeah, does this last? And there are of course quite a bit of initiatives, um, there are two ways to look at it. So first, it can be positive in the sense that, um, yeah, there's quite a bit of attention, quite a bit of investments. Um, at the time, we wrote an, uh, an ENI report uh, together with Mike Smets and tried to summarize all of the investment that has been done in Europe. And you see that there is quite a bit of attention, quite a bit of policy, quite a bit of investments. So of course, if there is a lot of attention, it might, of course, reduce the, um, the, the, the impact of the pandemic, and it might improve the learning outcomes of kids. Similarly, yeah, immediately after the pandemic, a lot of the mechanisms, I'll come later to that, uh, of the pandemic, they immediately vanished, so that you can expect that, it's, um, yeah, that, that also the learning deficits might vanish. And of course, after a while, also teachers and schools, they got better in remote teaching, such that if there is an additional holiday, if there is an additional quarantine period, it might be less uh, detrimental as initially in the, in the pandemic. On the other hand, we know that it might also create resiliency or it might also harm kids in the long run because there are poor levels of knowledge. And if you have a poor level of knowledge, this might accumulate over time because you know less in a given year, it, you know less in the next year. So you have to remediate, et cetera. And so you create a kind of accumulation over time. And as such, um, there are this kind of simulations that show that yeah, learning deficits, they might uh, increase over time, they might accumulate over time. And that's what we have to look for now in the empirical analysis. Second, yeah, it might also create a long-run impact because we know from earlier long-term disruptions like school, uh, like teacher strikes, like snowfall impact, like natural disasters, that test scores are not as resilient as we hope for. Very often we see long-term impact, like in the paper of uh, Michel Bellot and Dinant Webbing, for instance, they look at the teacher strikes in uh, the Wallonia, uh, area of Belgium, and they find the long-term impact of those strikes on high school outcomes, on dropouts, on university degrees, on income of students. So school outcomes are clearly not as resilient as we often think so. And third, of course, there are also heterogeneous impacts. Students, they differ. They differ in both their backgrounds and they differ in their personality. And so some students, they might suffer more than other students. I'll come later to this uh, again. So the question is, which of the two prevails? And is it the negative ones or the positive ones that prevail? And if you look at the resiliency one year after the pandemic, you can see that for different countries, for different test scores, uh, for different uh, subjects, like for math and language, we observe a difference. So for instance, um, in Flanders, one year after the pandemic, after the first uh, calculations that I did uh, together with um, Joanna Maldonado, we observe a an, an slightly positive impact, a slightly uh, lower uh, learning deficits uh, for math. This was not the case for languages. In Greece, in Hungary, in uh, the Netherlands, and in the UK, you observe in all of the three of and, and all of the math test scores a further decrease in the test scores and a further acceleration of the impact of the pandemic. This was not the case in languages, as you see. So, for some countries like in the Netherlands and the UK, one year after the pandemic, you observe a slightly more resilient test score uh, impact. So this shows that there's quite a bit of heterogeneity across Europe. There's quite a bit of heterogeneity in, um, in the topics as well, in the subjects as well. And so at the moment, two years uh, after the pandemic, yeah, it's not a fully clear trend. 
But given those earlier commands, so given the negative elements here and the accumulation, the potential accumulation, the potential non-resiliency of school outcomes, it signals that we really need to take care. We need really to look at, um, yeah, monitor closely the resilience of test scores and uh, have an, an, a strong yeah, policy, um, policy impact and try to uh, account for those deficits over time. Second part of the paper deals with the mechanisms. And mechanisms are, yeah, why do we observe for some countries, why do you observe for some students more or lower or higher impact than for other ones? And of course, the first and natural step stone is uh, the school closures. The more lengthy, the lengthier the school closures, it is expected that there is more impacts of the pandemic as well. And that's exactly what we see in the data. If we look in Europe, in all countries where we observe uh, the length of the of the, the school closures and if, where we observe the standard deviation, so the impact of the pandemic on different subjects, we observe a strong negative correlation between lengthier school closures and uh, learning outcomes. So if there is a lengthier school closure, we observe higher learning deficits. The correlation is 0.61, and uh, if you compute this in a kind of meta-analysis, as we did in the paper, you see that one week longer school closure corresponds to a learning deficit or a higher learning deficit of 0.007 standard deviation. It's insignificant because, of course, there are few countries, but still that gives you an idea on why do we observe in some countries a different outcome than in other countries. And of course, the natural um, reason for that is, yeah, if you have lengthy school closures, you lose instruction time because instruction time is not as effective as in school. Um, you lose automatisms. So younger kids, for instance, they lose how to do the calculus, how to do the reading, etc. And the instruction times are simply less effective, definitely in the beginning of the pandemic, um, where we didn't have the full ICT possibilities to give distance learning, for instance. Second mechanism um, are the age of the students. Age of the students in the sense that, yeah, younger students, they are more harmed than older students. And that's exact, again what we see in the data. So if you look at this graph, we here computed um, the correlation between the grades of the students, so the, uh, the age basically of the student and the learning deficit. And you see a strong correlation again, so points uh, 32, and the correlation with a one year older student has less learning deficit, so 0.005 standard deviation. Again, it's insignificant because of the low power of the analysis, but still it gives you an ID. And the reason why age matters is, of course, yeah, for young kids, think about kids in primary education, the first grades of primary education, it's very difficult to self-regulate them. And so if they were at home, as in the picture that I showed you in the beginning, it's very difficult for them to, to, to monitor their tasks, to think about the next steps, etc. So self-regulation for younger kids is far more difficult than, for instance, and university students. Similarly, yeah, if you simply start with the calculus, uh, yeah, it's very easy to re to re to uh, forget the the learning content and to forget the automatisms. Whereas for older students, this is already more closed in their uh, brains, and we can compare it a little bit to the summer loss. So summer loss also it's more uh, negative for, for instance, the younger students. It also creates an um, an impact of about one point eighteen standard deviations. So it gives you a very similar idea, and but of course. On the contrary, we observe in many countries that at the time when there were the school closures, that the school closures were longer for older students. So this correlates a little bit again with this uh, first mechanism that I just presented. Third reason why we observe differences across countries is the availability and the use of education uh, of ICT. So some countries were simply well prepared and other countries were not as well prepared for, um, for distance learning. And if you compare, for instance, those two figures here, if you have a country where there was a lot of ICT possibilities, where as a teacher you do have a dashboard uh, to monitor your students, where there was elaborated feedback and learning paths, uh, etc. So you could easily give tasks, you could easily give a distance learning to the students. Whereas if you are in, working in a country with few possibilities of using ICT and you have to distribute uh, all kinds of piece of paper to the students, you have to go to the students physically to distribute a piece of papers. It's a completely different world. It's a completely different way of dealing with the pandemic. It's very difficult to reach all students again. And so that's again what we observe in the data. If we look in the report to each country and we try to see what is the status of the ICT, what kind of possibilities are there in terms of hardware of ICT? What are the preconditions in terms of teacher preparedness of packages, et cetera? We see that there is a strong correlation again with the test scores. 
Um, of course, it's not because there is a high infrastructure and a very solid infrastructure in terms of ICT that it's also used. And for instance, the case of Belgium, um, we, in Belgium, there is a very high, um, a very good infrastructure in terms of ICT, but in education, there is few use of ICT. There was few professional development of ICT such that, yeah, it's a sufficient condition it's a necessary condition to have the ICT infrastructure, but it's not a sufficient condition. You need also the teachers, you need the school system to work with that. Similarly, in Denmark, for instance, where there was few impact of the pandemic, you see that in Denmark, yeah, they both have the infrastructure and they both are used before the pandemic to use ICT in schools. So that both the necessary and the sufficient condition of uh, ICT use is present in the country. Okay, so that's a an, uh, an, an, uh, third mechanism. And the fourth mechanism, of course, is that, yeah, in many European countries, uh, if not in most European countries, we observe a declining trend in international tests, like, for instance, TALIS, like, for instance, PEARLS, like, for instance, the PISA test scores. And um, if there was already a decline in the test scores of a country, the pandemic simply accelerated those existing trends. So the pandemic uh, acted like a kind of accelerator uh, for the, the present trends. And that's what we observe um, in the data as well. So in the report, we try to correlate a little bit the trends. We try to see a little bit what are for the different countries, um, the trend and their test scores. And we observe this, um, this correlation, this reinforcement uh, in the existing trends. In terms of advice or in terms of um, yeah, research advice, this means that we really need to take care of for the trend as well. So in definitely in the most recent papers, papers that are published two years, three years after the pandemic, we need to account for the trend because otherwise the, the impact of the pandemic is simply overestimated because we are computing also the um, uh, capturing part of the trends. Similarly, if we compare with uh, learning with uh, age groups from before, if you compare with older students, yeah, you also have a strong cohort where you compare to such that the impact of the pandemic will be overestimated. So we need to take this into account as well. So in sum, this is what we observe in terms of mechanisms. Uh, we observe quite a bit of difference across countries. The difference is due to the school closures, the length of the school closures, it's due to the age of the students where we have data for. It's due to the uh, infrastructure, both the use of ICT infrastructure as well as the actual use and practice in education and the professional development and the readiness of teachers. And it's due to the existing trends in the education system. Third question that we pose in the report is heterogeneity. Because of course, yeah, we always look at the average students but there's quite a bit of differences between these students. So there are strong students, there are weak students, there are students which are coming from a favorable economic background, there are students who are coming from an unfavorable economic background. And that's what we look in, in the heterogeneity. And we make the distinction in the report between sources where we have strong evidence, like for instance, for socioeconomic status. No matter how we measure our socioeconomic status, both with parental education, with income, etc., uh, we see in every country a strong evidence of socioeconomic status on the learning outcomes. And in most countries, we see that the impact of the pandemic in terms of learning deficits is twice as high for the low SES students as for the high SES students. So the impact of the pandemic was far more for the low SES students simply because, yeah, they didn't have a quiet place to study, they didn't have ICT availability, there was lower parental involvement, we couldn't reach those kids. Um, and that's why you also observe that the, there is an increase in inequality. So the spread in test scores increased between the strong and the weak students. Uh, with, for instance, low SES students um, who were very good, they were more harmed than the, the high SES students uh, who were good. And so you see in many education systems, um, strong evidence of both the impact of SES as well as of a rise of inequality, both within and across schools. Second or third source of inequality is the gender gap. For the gender gap, we observe mixed evidence. So there are countries where girls do better. There are countries where it didn't matter the gender. There are countries where the boys do uh, better. If we can say something about the gender gap, we observe that um, there is an increased gender gap for women in mathematics and the well-being uh, from quantitative evidence. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we also observe a positive influence for boys in other countries. Um, and there is also a little bit of correlation with the uh, socioeconomic status because, of course, socioeconomic status is quite a strong indicator. Um, but if we look at low SES girls, for instance, they, exper they experience more levels of uh, mental issues and mental health issues compared to the high SES girls. 
But again, so the evidence on, on gender is quite mixed. Similarly, the evidence on migrants is relatively mixed, um, in which in most countries we don't observe any additional learning deficits for uh, migrant students. In other countries, we do observe and um, the impacts of home language, for instance, that was um, not as good in the sense that it was more difficult to go back to school, for instance, because they were taught at school, at home the native language all the time. And so they forgot a little bit the, the native language and they were taught at the home language, not the native language. And so they forgot the, the native language. So you, you see in some countries incre increasing language barriers. Um, we see in some countries um, less language instruction for migrant students, such that there was an impact, but in other countries we don't observe this, so that's mixed evidence. And similarly, for special education needs students, we observe that uh, yeah, those students, they had less access to the specialized tools that they were normally using, such that yeah, it impacted their, um, their, their outcomes, their, both their student outcomes as well as, um, as, well as their mental health. And so it reinforced a little bit again the pre-pandemic trends, but in other education systems we didn't see that. So there's um, quite mixed evidence there. Third, in terms of um, mental health, yeah, we always looked at in the beginning of the pandemic. Many people said, "Yeah, this remote teaching that's actually a very nice environment for introvert students." So for some students, it has their advantages. And that's exactly what we try to describe in the report as well. So if you look at personality traits, for instance. We observed that uh, for some students, the remote teaching and the pandemic was quite a beneficial um, element in the sense that students who were consciousness, students who were introverts, um, they decreased in stress. They didn't feel less tensions. Um, they did feel less tensions at home um, and they had good experiences with the distance learning, whereas other students who were more extroverts, they really missed school. Uh, neurotic students who were uh, feeling a lot of vulnerability and a lot of stress, yeah, they, they really hated this, um, this distance learning and they felt a lot of stress, such that, of course, this creates kind of mental issues for them as well. And so these are heterogeneity by personality traits, which we don't often observe in literature. Um, this is coming from a paper that is um, measured personality traits right before the pandemic and then uh, looking afterwards. Uh, but if you look at mental health outcomes more in general, there's this report from the, the OECD and the European Commission, where you observe in almost all countries an, uh, a strong increase in the issues of mental health. Um, this is here the example, for instance, of uh, symptoms of depression. And you see the, a sharp increase uh, from the, since the pandemic in most countries, also countries with um, short school closures, eh? like in Sweden, for instance. So it's it's really the pandemic effects in, in the, the, the newspapers um, and the, the pressure that it gave on students, that it gave on teachers that um, give rise to this uh, mental health issues. So also in terms of mental health, we have to monitor closely um, in the sense that, yeah, we see that um, in many education systems an increased loneliness feelings of students an increase anxiety, depression, suicidal um, behavior. And of course, if you if you have issues with your mental health, it's also difficult to learn and it's also difficult to, um, to do well at school. So you see the impact on learning outcomes as well. There are, of course, resiliency factors. So some students, they did better than other students, depending on the personality of the students. And not everybody's as effective as the average students. But um, also with re relationship with socioeconomic status, in the sense that low SES students um, with low SES parents, for instance, they were more harmed in terms of their mental health than the high SES parents and the high SES students. So you see also there again, this strong evidence of socioeconomic status coming back. So this brings me to the conclusion. Um, I hope I provided you a little bit of an overview of the, of the report in terms of what we did in terms of um, school outcomes, uh, what we did in terms of heterogeneity analysis, in terms of mechanisms, and in terms of mental health. And from the report, we also tried to look at some recommendations. And we make recommendations both in the short run as well as in the medium and long run. In the short run, yeah, I tried to explain that the, the learning deficits are probably there to stay. The learning deficits are quite hard to, to vanish. And so we need a lot of compensatory policies. We need to invest a lot in summer programs and tutoring programs and additional uh, tutoring to stop those learning deficits. So we do have this, this responsibility to 
to monitor for every student and to, to target every student uh, to make sure that we um, don't speak about this lost generation, but that we really overcome this and uh, try to, to redo the gap that we try to um, improve the learning outcomes of every student. On the other hand, as a second short-term recommendation, we observed that some students were more harmed than other students. And so we have both the, the mental health issues as well as the low socioeconomic, uh, the, the mental health issues as well as the school outcomes, particularly for the low socioeconomic status students. And so this means that we have to focus particularly also on those students. And so on top of doing this for the average students and, and focusing on the average students, we have to uh, focus in particularly for low social students, young students um, who lost their automatisms, um, who are trying to get back on track over time, and students um, who experience a lengthy school closure. And in some education systems, the, um, we open school again earlier for younger students, for instance, and not for uh, slightly older students or vice versa. Similarly, um, yeah, we have to learn from the pandemic. And um, if we see the, the role of the personality traits, some students, they, they, they flourished during the pandemic and some students, they were very happy with remote teaching. So we can probably use some ingredients from the pandemic and not go back to normal um, as we are doing in most education systems at the moment. But for instance, use distance learning for conscious students um, because those students, they were doing pretty well during the pandemic. Third, both in the short and in the long run, we have to think about evidence-based education. And so we have to, to use standardized tests to detect the needs, to see where do we need to monitor, who do we have to target, what are the student groups who are falling behind, both in terms of school outcomes as well as in mental health. We have to monitor the resiliency. As I showed you, it can go, go both ways. Uh, there are elements that that speak in flavor of the, in favor of the resiliency. There are in, uh, elements that that say that yeah, it's it's very difficult to get resilient school outcomes. So we have to monitor this uh, year by year. Of course, it gets more and more difficult because you do have the trends, you do have all of the other issues. Uh, but um, monitoring is very important, and we have to evaluate the cost effectiveness. There's quite a bit of initiatives nowadays. Um, both in the short run and in, um, like those compensatory policies, like the targeted compensatory policies. So monitor the effectiveness of this by using experiments, by using quasi-experiments, such that we know what works and what are the costs of what works. What is the cost effectiveness of what works such that we can do better with the, with the given resources. Fourth, we can adapt to curriculum. So as I told you, some students, they lost the automatism. Some students, they don't really know what to do. And so if we focus the curriculum on the essential skills, um, then we can do better and we don't uh, have this accelerated effect over time. Um, we can also try to focus on the curriculum because there is quite a bit of tendency in education to always broaden the curriculum and to do more and more and more and to take more and more responsibility for the schools and less for the parents. So we can use the, um, the COVID-19 outcomes now as, well, as a way to focus the curriculum. And we have to make sure that we don't lose the top students. A uh, teacher in, in any class, he or she has only two hands. And um, if there is a lot of attention to the weaker students and a lot of attention to the low socioeconomic status students, we might lose the top students um, out of the, uh, and, and, and if we lose them, they do have lower test outcomes. That's what you observe in some education systems at the moment, that particularly the best students, the top group is decreasing over time, such that, yeah, we, we need to not only focus on uh, the low tests, but also on the, the top students and don't forget them. And at the fifth um, recommendation, yeah, there is quite a bit of investment nowadays in education. So about 14% of the European recovery and resiliency facilities is for education. So this corresponds to about 71 billion euros. So it's an enormous amount of money that is going to education. Uh, and we know from the literature that simply spending more money to education, it's not always the key. It depends on how you spend it and what you do with the money. And we have to spend the money wisely. Um, wise ways are, for instance, focusing on ICT hardware and software, such that we are ready for the next pandemic, um, updating the school infrastructure, because we know that there's quite a bit of impact of school infrastructure as well, uh, but also looking at teachers and teacher professional development, such that teachers are ready and that we that they are able to accommodate with, um, with uh, yeah, the outcomes and the well-being of the kids. So these are five recommendations, and I hope uh, you can use them in your practice and we can uh, see them coming uh, in the next few years. 
thank you very much. I'm very happy to um, to respond to any questions. So please, in the chat, you can have all questions such that I can, can I respond to them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christoph, for your excellent presentation, especially because you managed to present uh, all the main findings of your report in just 20 minutes. You know, the report is very rich, so I can only recommend that uh, our participants uh, read the full report because it's really very, very comprehensive and it has a lot of, uh, of very useful and also in, say, interesting policy implications for, uh, for everybody. Now it's time to, to start our discussion. Uh, uh, we will start with Alice Bertoletti. Alice is a researcher from the Education and Skills team of the European Commission's Joint Research Center in Seville, Spain. Alice will give us uh, uh, her views about uh, COVID-19 learning deficits. So please, Alice, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marco. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank Professor De Witte for sharing uh, this really interesting uh, report and the results with us today. And yes, I'm very happy to be here and discuss uh, such an important topic and to have the opportunity to share some thoughts about the main takeaways of, uh, from this study. So I have to say that I really appreciate this report, this report because it's not only providing some comprehensive review over the effect of COVID-19 on the educational performance and, uh, and students' well-being of, across the European uh, countries, but it's also tried to link to some of the results with uh, the contextual information that we have on educational system and all the policy uh, on how governments have dealt with this emergency. I, I think nowadays it's very important to have this information in order to really understand and interpret the results that uh, we have um, about the effect of COVID-19 across different uh, European countries. And indeed, I would like to focus my discussion on uh, maybe on the policy implication and the, and the mechanism that uh, has been suggested uh, in, uh, in this report. I think that one of the main key points uh, that have been uh, highlighted in, uh, in the study is the central role of uh, the technology and the digital skills of students and, and teachers in mitigating the learning loss. And um, as said, um, countries had, um, and, and school with a better ICT infrastructure, but also that before the pandemic had teachers and students reporting higher digital skills uh, were at the end were like, were better able to cope with the pandemic during, um, during this period. So um, I think, uh, as uh, I like in the report, uh, I think uh, this is why many countries have started to invest in, uh, in uh, for improving the technology in the infrastructure of the school. And, and somehow this is uh, accelerating uh, the process of uh, this, this digitalization uh, of the educational system. So I think that now it uh, also would be very uh, interesting to understand how the digitalization of school has changed in response to this situation, especially for uh, the country that uh, before the pandemic were not uh, were not so uh, well prepared, were less prepared to deal with digital uh, learning. So in somehow what would be in the effect of COVID-19 during these years in accelerating this process of, of digitalization. And uh, uh, linked to the technology, the ICT aspect, uh, I think that uh, for sure this emerges as an important role. Um, but also I, uh, from, the, from the reports, uh, is I like that there is still not a clear uh, understanding of how specific digital teaching practices have been able to mitigate the effect of the pandemic on students' learning. And um, in a recent study we conducted as a GLC together also with the external researchers, we, we focused a little bit on these uh, spe specific uh, issues. And we found indeed that the, the behavior of the teachers in using digital tools has been quite heterogeneous. And these, uh, the digital practice uh, on how the teachers uh, uh, that implemented uh, during uh, the school closure uh, were significantly correlated with uh, this, what the, stu the students' standardized test scores, but also with the, the perceived quality of teaching. 
So I think this is, uh, uh, once again, suggests that uh, it's very important, of course, to have the technological infrastructure, but also it's very important to invest in the training uh, uh, on digital teaching and support teachers in funding how to better use this uh, technology, to better use the digital tools. And uh, this is, uh, I think, be very important in uh, this uh, new normality that, uh, that of course, is uh, we have now that students have come back to presential classes, and uh, but still digital learning, I think, would be cover a uh, important role and to be and it would be very integrated uh, in the teaching activities, uh, especially compared to the previous day pandemic. And another <clears throat> interesting point that. Uh, I, 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 want to, I would like to highlight uh, that emerged from, from, from the report is that, um, as said by, uh, by Professor De Witt, the COVID-19 disruption has armed specific groups of students. But at the end, the roots of these uh, disparities uh, that exist uh, among students are mainly linked to the socioeconomic backgrounds. And for this, uh, um, and for this reason, uh, the, this, uh, to deal with these issues, uh, many countries have started to implement the uh, conservative policy uh, addressed to these uh, disadvantaged students. Um, however, also we know that the socioeconomic status has always been uh, the key determinant of uh, educational performance to, to um, uh, affect the educational performance of students. And this was true also before the pandemic. So it seems, it seems that in somehow the COVID-19 disruption has made these disparities that were already present in the past even more, uh, even more evident. And for this, for this reason, I'm wondering if there is the possibility this the policy action that now has been implemented in order to help the, the, the students with the socioeconomic, uh, with lower socioeconomic backgrounds uh, to cope with the uh, with the learning loss they, they received they, they would, with uh, the effort of the pandemic, but also could have also a longer effect and persist in the future. And this way, able to address the general education disparity that we observed also before the pandemic, uh, that there was existing between students with low and uh, high socioeconomic status. And, uh, and finally, I, will, I would like um, um, and finally, we see that uh, during after three years from the start of the pandemic, now we have a lot of evidence on the COVID-19 and education. And in the next month, also will be available the PETA data. Uh, for, so uh, that it will offer a, a very important instrument for studying this topic from a cross-country uh, perspective. And in this regard, uh, maybe I would like to open the next session, the, the, the Q&A session. Uh, and so asking to Professor De Witte, uh, given your expertise in the topic uh, and the analysis of, of the, the literature on the, the evidence on the COVID-19, of the effect of COVID-19 on education, what are now the evidence that are still missing uh, uh, on this topic. Uh, so which are, what are the priority issues on which research should focus to support uh, uh, policymakers in the next month uh, and year. So this is my general question uh, to to start a little bit uh, the the discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Alice. So we already have also some interesting questions from uh, our participants. Maybe Christoph, if you want to start uh, by replying to to Alice's question, then I will uh, I will transmit you the the questions that are coming from uh, from the chat. So the one about you know. What is missing in uh, from the evidence? Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, so that's a very interesting question. So what is missing? Because it uh, determines a little bit the research agenda as well. But um, I was also at the honor to participate in the expert group on quality education from the European Commission. And in this expert group, uh, together with a lot of colleagues, we try to assess, so what do we know for different topics? Eh? So what do we know for teaching, for instance, for infrastructure, for uh, teachers, etc. And we observed that, um, yeah, there is quite a bit of evidence available, but it's mainly available for Anglo-Saxon action countries, so mainly for the US, mainly for the UK, and we do have less evidence available for Europe. So, and the, the evidence that is available for Europe is often not 
experimental or quasi-experimental such that we can really see the impact, the causal impact of some interventions. So my suggestion would be here, so what is missing? I think that we should do far more experimental and uh, quasi-experimental evidence. And given the massive amounts of investments nowadays um, in the education system, so the 71 billion euro from the resiliency plans, for instance, yeah, there is quite a bit of opportunity to, to, to measure this and to estimate both the effects and the cost effectiveness of those interventions. Um, in many, many education systems, we see that governments are uh, developing summer schools, for instance, that they are developing tutoring, uh, that they are improving the infrastructure, the ICT infrastructure, that they are creating um, learning paths, uh, digital learning paths for students to give them feedback, to give them differentiated instruction, etc. But often we don't measure the impact of that. And that's, of course, a shame because then we don't know what we can learn from an education system to another education system. We don't know what works, what doesn't work. And um, so my suggestion would be, yeah, use this momentum now to improve our education and to do far more um, experimental, quasi-experimental evidence such that we know both the effects as well as the costs uh, such that we can relate also in cost effectiveness analysis. So yeah, is a summer school, for instance, more cost effective than a tutoring session? Or um, do we have to tutor in small classes rather than in large classes? And what is the difference in that? So um, that would be my main suggestion here indeed. Thank you very much, Christoph. This is a bit also the, you know, the main aim of our Learning Lab initiative that you know also comes from the, the expert group that you were part of. And of course, it, uh, we try to follow this, this kind of recommendation and we hope we'll, uh, we'll be able also to, you know, to engage our member states in this, kind of, uh, in this kind of activity. Now, I stop advertising what we do in the commission and I, I will pass to, to, to the questions. So the first one, uh, I think it's a very interesting one because it, uh, it refers to your recommendation about not losing focus on top students. So because the, our common view, probably the most intuitive view, is that in principle, the pandemic should have been more detrimental for, you know, for weak and st weaker students because we may assume that uh, you know, top performers were uh, you know, more able to self-direct their work, so they could have suffered a bit, uh, a bit less. So in the end, could you explain a bit more what's the challenge for, um, for high-achieving students? Yeah, indeed. So what we observe is that there's quite a bit of attention since the pandemic, actually since the very start of the pandemic, to the low test students. So um, teachers were urged to not forget the low test students, to reach them. Um, they didn't have a room to study. They didn't have the ICT equipment, etc. Ever since the pandemic, since the school reopened, there was quite a bit of media attention to those low test students. And of course, if you have a class of 24 students, yeah, it's very difficult for a teacher to deal with all students given the increased inequality in the education system. So the spread and test scores increased in every country. That's what's the strong evidence that I showed you. And as such, we always have this idea that yeah, the strong students, they will manage. The strong students, they can self-regulate. The strong students can set their ambitions themselves. But that's what, not what we observe in, in, for instance, in our own data in Flanders, but also in other countries. We observe that the top students, the, the very best students, um, the, the ones in, uh, because you referred to uh, PISA, for instance, but the ones who are in PISA, for instance, in level five, and so the, the really independent students, that we are losing them, that this group shrinks these groups get smaller and um, their test scores decrease even sometimes even more than before the pandemic. And as such, um, this is because we, yeah, in an education system, a teacher, it's very difficult for a teacher to deal with both the weak students, which have to attain the minimum goals, but we really have to make sure that they, that they reach the minimum goals and the strong students. So this heterogeneity, the inequality is too large. And yeah, the ambitions go down for those top students. Um, we don't, support them sufficiently, we don't um, yeah, trigger them sufficiently such that um, their test, test scores go uh, actually down as well. Of course, they are still performing better than the, than the weak students, eh? but they go, compared to the pre-pandemic area, they, um, they, they, do, they do worse indeed. Um, and that's exactly the thing that we often tend to forget, eh? simply because it's, it's easy or it's, it's natural to focus on weak students 
but top students, we need them as well, of course, both for our economy, for our knowledge economy to, to create all kinds of new innovations, um, etc. So these are the students that will create a massive improvement in welfare in, in the end. So we, we should also trigger them and, and have high ambitions for them as well. And um, this relates a little bit to what you said about um, ICT. So ICT, it ICT doesn't really have to replace a teacher. ICT can support a teacher. And ICT has the tools to differentiate. Uh, within an ICT program, you can easily program different learning paths, a learning path for strong students, a learning path for weaker students. You can create elaborated feedback for some students and less feedback for other students. And so in, in situations as after the pandemic where there is an increase in equality in test scores, yeah, ICT, where there are even teacher shortages, uh, um, teach, we, we can use ICT to support teachers and to make sure that they reach every student. And then the teacher can be more and more the expert, which, which helps students that, 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 that need the help. And so there is quite a bit of research on this topic as well, showing that this is a very effective and cost-effective way to, to help students. Uh, and, that's, and that's a way to not forget the high achievers indeed. Thank you very much, Christoph. Very clear. Uh, we have another key question for uh, designing uh, no, effective uh, targeted interventions. It's uh, about the interplay between migrant and socioeconomic status. Uh, in your study, you don't find uh, no, clear evidence of a specific uh, migrant-related disadvantage. Uh, but when migrants belong to socially disadvantaged groups, do they suffer the same loss as non-migrants or, uh, or not? Yeah, indeed, that's a very interesting question as well. Um, in the report, we try to be as nuanced as possible. In the presentation, I didn't go into all of the details on that, simply because it's, um, yeah, otherwise it will be too much. But indeed, uh, of course, if migrants were part of this low socioeconomic status groups, they had very similar effects as the, 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 the general uh, low SES populations. Um, if studies did a distinction between migrant and non-migrant, and so if they pooled everybody, because of course migrants are not always the low SES students, um, then we didn't uh, observe this. Then we observed this mixed evidence in the sense that in some countries there was a positive, some sometimes no differential effect. Uh, but indeed, the SES characteristic that we tried to to show in the reports it dominates, of course, uh, many of the other characteristics. Huh? So similarly with gender, there is no heterogeneity or strong heterogeneity with respect to gender. But if there is a low SES interaction, then you do have this uh, this interaction coming up again. No, thank you. I think it's also one of the key messages from your report that socioeconomic status seem to, seems to dominate uh, other uh, no, specific, uh, specific features. So, and it's often difficult, as you also elaborate in the report, it's difficult to disentangle the specific effect of being migrant from the one of, being, of, uh, being, uh, of coming from uh, socioeconomic disadvantaged status. The same may happen to students with special education needs, for instance, that's another point that you dis discuss in the report. Uh, then another question is uh, about uh, does this all mean for, for teachers? So you recently you've also been, you wrote one of the first papers that analyzed the, uh, you know, the, post, the impact of teacher shortage on uh, uh, learning deficits, especially the persistence of, of learning deficits in, uh, in Flanders. And you show that uh, uh, schools uh, experiencing uh, uh, more teacher shortages, found it more difficult to recover from, uh, no, from, their, from their learning losses. Uh, at the same time, we start having some evidence that uh, no, teacher shortage, as many other features, already exist, existed before COVID-19, but COVID-19 may have exacerbated them. Uh, for instance, let's think uh, about you know, the issue of uh, well-being uh, of teachers. Teachers had to, you know, to uh, to, to overcome a period of uh, sometimes incredible stress. During, so some teachers had to leave the profession. So this may have had a negative impact. So what is your view uh, about the, the, so the future? What is the, the kind of causal chain between, uh, uh, be, between these features? So uh, we have teacher shortages. Teacher shortages may make it more difficult to recover from learning deficits. And at the same time, COVID, uh, in a sense, may have exacerbated teacher losses, so then, sorry, teacher shortages. So, is the is the picture in a sense even more negative than one may think? Uh, you know, taking a kind of static approach. 
Yeah, indeed. So thanks for the question, uh, because yeah, teacher shortages they are a, a key element in the in the current debate. Huh? So for many of the topics that I that I discussed on the policy recommendation. So if you both have compensatory policies, targeted pol compensatory policies, you need people to to give the tutoring sessions. If you want to work in small sessions uh, with few kids. Uh, if you want to to give special summer schools, for instance, to few kids, yeah, you need people to give them, and that's exactly where the teacher shortages are, of course, now, um, yeah, getting an, a very difficult angle on this. And in many European countries, we observe strong um, and, and, and significant teacher shortages, and of course, they 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 were exacerbated, as you said, due to the pandemic. Eh? So. Um, since the pandemic, there was a lot of pressure on teachers, and there was a lot of uncertainty on teachers. Um, there is now this increased inequality, the issues with mental health of students, such that for a lot of teachers, this is quite a bit of a burden. It's very difficult to manage class groups because of the mental health, because of the, um, the, 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 the conduct of, of some students. And you see in, in administrative data a peak in absenteeism of teachers. That's what we observe in, in the data. And from the absenteeism, we see that it's very difficult to replace a teacher after a while. So the more absenteeism, the more teacher shortages. And then if a student is, if a teacher is not there, yeah, of course, what does a student have to do? A student is sent to study, is sent home uh, with just a textbook and just left on his or on, on own. And indeed in the paper that um, I did with uh, Letizia Gambi, we tried to see what is the impact of teacher shortages now on test scores. And um, in the paper, we, we have a panel data sets with exactly the same schools over time, but then the teacher shortages based on administrative data, the test scores on that. And we account for all observed and unobserved school characteristics. We observe for all things that change over time, like socioeconomic status of the kids, et cetera. And then we observe that in an average school of 13 teachers, where we see one teacher who is not replaced, so a real teacher shortage, that this has an impact on the math test scores and the language test scores of an additional two weeks of learning deficits. And that's in primary education, where you don't have the specialized teachers as much as in secondary education. Because in secondary education, you have a separate math teacher and a separate geography teacher and a separate history teacher, such that it's even more difficult to replace a teacher. So the, the effects are probably even worse in uh, secondary education. So in that sense, teacher shortages, they, yeah, they, they don't help us with overcoming the, the lower test scores, the, the, the learning deficits that we observe now they might even accelerate this uh, over time. And so that's why, again, um, I strongly believe in the use of ICT in that, in the sense that we can yeah, not replace a teacher, but we can facilitate. If there is no teacher, maybe we can use a little bit of the, the things that we learned during the pandemic of pre-teaching and of um, having separate classes where there isn't someone else. There's many students nowadays have laptops in many education systems since the pandemic. So use the laptops in a smart way such that they can replace partly the teacher and then afterwards, after the pre-teaching, there is an, um, a teacher coming in again. And this might be a way to, um, to overcome this because it's, 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 it will be a very long lasting impact of, um, of this teacher shortage. Thank you very much, Christoph. We have a final question. Uh, your report uh, focuses on school education, but of course education doesn't stop uh, uh, at age uh, 18. Uh, so what challenging do you see for um, adult education in the future due to the effect uh, of the pandemic? Yeah, indeed, we didn't focus on adult education. Uh, so thank you very much for this question because it's adult education is quite a little bit of difference. So within adult education, there's more focus on, for instance, upskilling, reskilling of adults. And yeah, that's something that is I'm not aware of many papers focusing on um, the impact of the pandemic, for instance, on adult education. So um, to be honest, I, I have a bit to be silent on this question, uh, but it's an, an, yeah, it might fit also with the earlier um, question by uh, Mrs. Bertolia. Yeah? So on what next steps have to do in the, after the pandemic. So maybe focusing more on adult education because there are quite a bit of challenges in adult education as well. So we, we have everything which has to deal with, uh, with the green technologies. We have everything which has to deal with um, heavy polluters, which have to decrease, and, and sectors that have to change. So reskilling, upskilling is an important aspect, and adult education comes within that. And um, if there was less adult education during the pandemic, yeah, we might also be delayed with uh, changing those sectors again. So in that perspective, it might be an, um, a very interesting research question for maybe a next session. Uh, 
but unfortunately for this time, I'm, I have to be, I don't, we, we didn't really focus on that. Thank you, Christo. So it's uh, 11 o'clock, so it's time to, um, to sum up and conclude. Uh, if I have to take uh, no, one main, uh, no, main message from your report for us, I mean, for policy makers, I think that we, no, nothing is predetermined in a sense. If we look at uh, no, both the short and the long term, we shouldn't speak of a lost generation, but at the same time, we shouldn't just sit and uh, wait for, you know, for everything to come back uh, to, to the pre-COVID situation in a kind of natural way. So in a sense, really policy is even more fundamental than uh, probably in normal, uh, in normal circumstances. So this is why also your recommendations may be very useful. And this is also why from our side in the commission, we really need to, to put a lot of uh, focus and effort also on promoting initiatives that uh, can help uh, uh, our students to uh, overcome all possible difficulties. Because we here we are speaking mainly of course of learning losses, uh, but we can also think about, uh, you know, welfare losses, uh, well-being losses, if you, if you want. So we have both dimensions to, to take into account. But so I think that uh, this is a kind of message for, um, for all people that are involved uh, in policy. So let's not forget about uh, what has happened with COVID-19. And at the same time, we should be confident that if we find the right policies, we can uh, you know, overcome the, the the difficult situation that we inherited from from COVID-19. So hoping this is a kind of fair uh, summary from, from our discussion. So let me conclude by thanking uh, Akis, Christoph uh, and Alice for their uh, excellent interventions, all participants for their questions and comments. And last but not least, I also special thank to INI for uh, hosting us today, in particular to Katazin and Agne, who have worked behind the scenes to organize and manage this webinar. Uh, so thank you very much again and have a nice day. Bye.